Thank you, Corey, for that lovely introduction. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to go right to the outline. So I'm going to go very quickly through the first two sections, since most of that's review. We're going to spend most of our time on the third section with the novel agents that are going to be up and coming. There's some that are have FDA breakthrough designations, so they're going to be hitting your clinics probably, hopefully later this year, if not early next year. And then future combinations about how we're dealing with EGFR TKI resistance. So beginning first with a very fast review, I don't think I want to go into too much detail. Dr. Ramalingan pretty much hit this already, but your EGFR mutations are not the same. We do know that the deletion exon 19 may be more sensitive to some of the agents, um, in particular afatinib. Um, versus, you know, there was a retrospective study that indicated that. Um, but we do know that these patients do tend to do better overall than the L858 mutations. Now, usually these patients you have to watch pretty closely after about a year to year and a half while they're on an EGFR TKI, whether it's reversible or potentially irreversible EGFR TKI, because they do develop resistance. Now, obviously, resistance is our biggest problem. Um, this is just a table that was published in 2013 showing some of the different mechanisms of resistance. Um, you do want to make note that small cell lung cancer transformation is a possibility with these patients. Now, EGFR T790M is the one that is most famous. This is actually a point mutation that actually uh, leads towards blocking of the prior reversible EGFR TKIs into the binding pocket. And so it's basically a mechanism of resistance where the drug is no longer effective in these patients. Okay, so what do we do in the clinic now? So there's two different types of progression that we need to talk about. The first is oligoprogression, and then the second is global progression. So I think it's pretty well established now that if you have oligoprogression, meaning you just have one site or a local area where the sites of disease tend to be growing a bit, most of us go after local definitive treatment with usually radiation therapy. In rare cases, sometimes surgical resection, um, if you really want to know what the clonality is and whether or not it's the T790M mutant. But there's been several trials retrospectively indicating that this definitely prolongs pre PFS for our patients. You can reestablish good control for them. And so this is definitely a methodology I think all of us do uh, with the oligoprogressor. Our biggest problem is going to be the global progressors. And so in these cases, there's rapid progression. Um, where you have to really think about small cell transformation. There's also the slow growth globally that occurs overall. And then there's the mixed pattern where you've got growth happening in one particular large area versus another. Now, usually in these cases, you want to biopsy the area that is rapidly growing or is growing most significantly. And you have to try to identify the mechanism of resistance. Now, there's been several different methods by which we've all gone after the EGFR-resistant patients. Um, but I just want to make a quick comment about the EGFR-TKI flare. This does happen. If you take off the EGFR-TKI, these patients can often get a flare of their disease. And so you have to be pretty quick in terms of instituting a second therapy for these patients. Now, what have we been doing? Well, these are our different options that we could do. We could stop the EGFR-TKI and give them chemo. We could give them chemo followed by reinstituting the EGFR TKI after a few cycles of therapy, or you could combine the chemotherapy with the EGFR TKI. And there have been other trials that we have done that have shown that these are all very safe to do. You know, we don't necessarily have much toxicity that's additive in our patients when we take any of these approaches. But the question has been, what is the optimal treatment for our patients? And I'm going to talk to you next about the trial IMPRESS, which just came out. So just a little bit of background. In the past, all of us thought that it was probably going to be OK if we combined an EGFR-TKI with chemo in our patients who had been on an EGFR-TKI and progressed and didn't have a T790M. And retrospective studies suggested that that might actually be beneficial. Um, and then there was also a Korean study that suggested that continuation EGFR-TKI might be beneficial for these patients beyond progression. Um, but there were two large studies, one in North America and then one also in East Asia, Europe, that was looking at this issue to try to define this prospectively. So I'm going to talk to you about the IMPRESS trial, which we have data from. So this was a study that um, basically enrolled chemo-naive patients who had been on an EGFR TKI, specifically gefitinib, and then they were randomized after they developed progression to cisplatin pemetrexid with the gefitinib versus cisplatin pemetrexid plus placebo. And then afterwards, they were looking at the patients in terms of PFS as well as response rate. Now, when we actually look um, across the board, this was both Europe and Asia, the patient characteristics were well balanced between the two arms. But the bottom line was there was absolutely no difference in response rate, 
or duration or stabilization of disease or disease control rate. And when we look at progression-free survival, it was also no different. So of most concern, though, is when we look at overall survival. The overall survival actually looked to favor the placebo arm. And so this was very concerning. It was 17.2 months with the placebo versus 14.8 months with Dufitinib. Now, when we look at the post-discontinuation therapy, because that can always mess with your arms, it did look that the placebo-containing arm did have an imbalance favoring it, where patients were more likely, if they got the placebo arm, to have salvage platinum-based doublet therapy and also were more likely to get reinstitution of a different EGFR TKI than gefitinib. So there is this imbalance that we have to weigh into our overall survival data. But what I would summarize about the IMPRESS trial, what we now know, is that the EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer patients who are resistant to gefitinib don't appear to have any benefit when you just continue gefitinib with the chemo versus just chemo alone. There's no difference in response rate, disease control rate, or PFS. The overall survival data is still immature, um, so whether or not we're hurting patients with this is unclear because of the post-discontinuation imbalance. Um, so we'll, we'll have to wait a little bit longer and see how that turns out. But the IMPRESS study tells us that combining an EGF, EGFR TKI with chemo after they've already progressed on the EGFR TKI is probably not our best strategy. So in this case then, our options are pretty much left to you just stop the EGFR TKI and do chemo or you do chemo and then sequence it with the EGFR TKI. So that is what I would recommend for standard practice right now. And I would not continue um, the EGFR TKI with the chemo in combination. Okay, so oligomet um, progressors on an EGFR TKI, definitive therapy with radiation or surgery, and then for the global um, patients who have progression, you want to biopsy them, make sure they're not T790M. If they're not, you can give them chemo or you could sequence chemo followed by EGFR TKI, but don't combine the chemo with the EGFR TKI. Okay, so what about the future? So this is hopefully just for the short term that we have to deal with um, sort of nonspecific things with chemo and sequencing chemo plus the EGFR TKI. There are several agents that are coming up that hopefully will be very effective against specifically the T790M mutant population. Um, I did want to touch bases quickly on efatinib. Um, as Dr. Ramalayan pointed out earlier today, efatinib is an irreversible EGFR TKI. The Lux Lung 3 study compared it to frontline platinum doublet and basically showed that Patients who have EGFR-sensitive mutations have a favorable response rate with efatinib and also favorable progression-free survival, and specifically the common mutants typically would have a better PFS. And so this is definitely currently in use. Um, the big question is whether or not we should be giving efatinib frontline to our uh, exon 19 deletion patients. Um, and so I would say that that's the elephant in the room. None of us really know what we should be doing, whether it's reversible EGFR TKI with erlotinib here, um, or gefitinib in Asia and Europe, or if we should be doing efatinib. And so there are some studies that hopefully will give us more information. Um, but what I want to point out to you, though, is efatinib is being combined with cetuximab as a mechanism to overcome resistance. And so that's actually why I brought up the efatinib. So there have been preclinical studies that have shown that the combination of efatinib and cetuximab seems to have anti-tumor activity, specifically against T790 mutants. And so they conducted a phase 1b study and basically were not able to show any DLTs um, at the efatinib at 40 milligrams daily plus this tuximab. Now, Corey's shaking his head because he and I agree this actually did seem to be pretty toxic. <laughs> but according to the data, they said no DLTs at this dose, and they did do expansion cohorts at this. And so the data from this was recently presented, and it essentially showed that there was activity with the T790M patients. Um, specifically, we look at the disease um, duration of response for the T790Ms, it was 5.6 months with the combination, 9.5 with the T79 um, negative mutants, and then PFS, you could see across the board, didn't appear to be all that different. And then this is the waterfall plot with the red bars being the T790M population. So in terms of their toxicity profile, obviously rash and diarrhea, as you would imagine, was quite significant, as well as fatigue. So this is a combination that is currently being studied. Um, there was a pre-ECOG trial, which, um, Ram, I'm not sure, is this still going to be ongoing? This is a salvage trial. You guys nixed it? Okay. So SWOG did move forward with the um, frontline trial of a fatinib plus uh, versus a uh, fatinib plus cetuximab. But okay, cross this out on your 
on your list. I just found out they're, they're nixing it. So the issue with this combination is with the new third generation HGFR TKIs, this is probably a combination that would have been more relevant maybe four or five years ago. Um, but nevertheless, there is a trial that is going to be looking at this combination. Okay, so what about the third generation AGFR TKI? So we're going to talk about CO1686, which is rosalitinib, um, and AZD9291. Now these are very unique EGFR TKIs. These are probably, uh, they have FDA breakthrough designations, so um, hopefully these will come out into market later this year or early next. Now the CO1686 is specifically designed to hit key activating um, EGFR mutation, specifically T790M, and it is designed to not target EGFR wild type. So the goal of this was to not give the patients rash and diarrhea, but still be effective against the cancer, specifically the T790M malignancy. So this is the trial schema for the phase 1-2 study looking at CO1686, and there were several dose levels that were looked at in the phase 1. The bottom line to all of this, though, it can be seen on the waterfall plot here. So this is the best response for the patients in the phase one and early phase two expansion cohorts. And so the overall response rate to date was about 58%. And again, these were patients who had been pretreated before, and they were all centrally confirmed T790M patients. Um, if you look at the progression-free survival for this population, the median was not quite reached yet, but they estimate it to be over a year. So very effective agent. And this is an example that they showed at ASCO where there is CNS penetrance of these agents. So uh, this was in a patient who had three prior lines of therapy, had erlotinib immediately prior to CO1686. They had an 82% reduction in the tumor volume, and then they also had a nice response in the brain. So. There is something unique about these drugs, though, aside from their activity and their sparing of the EGFR wild type. They do have different side effect profiles, so this is important to know. This drug actually has hyperglycemia, and so there may be some interaction with IGF-R, um, but that's still the mechanism still has to be teased out a little bit better. But certainly, this is something you have to watch out for. So instituting um, insulin or an anti-glycemic um, uh, agent is certainly something that you need to watch out with these agents. Now, there was only 4% of patients who had any form of rash, and they were all grade 1. So obviously, a lot of our patients, I think, will really appreciate these agents once they come to market. So to summarize CO1686, 58% resist response rate. There is CNS responses. The median PFS may be well over a year. Um, it's well tolerated with no rash. Um, and it seems to um, have a weird toxicity, which is the hyperglycemia. And so there's a whole host of programs, um, clinical trials called the TIGER programs, and they're listed here. I'm making my slides available to all of you um, so you can read through this later um, when you have time. Okay, AZD9291 is another agent that's very similar to CO1686, being designed against the active, activating <coughs> EGFR mutation, specifically T790M. And so this is the trial design from their phase one. And you can see that they enrolled both T790M and T790M mutant, uh, sorry, T790 negative uh, patients as well in their different cohorts. Um, but the bottom line is this is the waterfall plot for their overall response rate in the overall population. Response rate was about 53%. Um, and then these were classifications by response. And when we specifically just take out the T790M mutants, you can see here by dose, um, how the waterfall plot is quite impressive with the SAGEN. So, and their response rate was about 64% in the T790M. Now, in terms of their safety summary, they reported no dose limiting toxicity at any of their doses, but this agent does have interstitial lung disease as a potential toxicity, and you also have to monitor their QTC interval by EKG. So, again, although these agents don't seem to have the rash and diarrhea as in the other class of the first generation EGFR TKI, there are other toxicities you have to keep an eye on um, when you utilize these drugs. So, Definitely different toxicity profiles, CO1686. You probably need to watch for hypoglycemia, AZD9291, ILD, and QTC prolongation. There's also another agent I didn't have time to go into, HM61713, and this appears to be um, induce some dyspnea in their initial phase one studies. So 9291 and CO1686, again, have FDA breakthrough designation. They may be highly effective against your T790M mutants who have developed the resistance after EGFR TKI. Um, the question will be whether or not we institute these agents earlier on in therapy. Um, and so that remains to be seen. And there are currently trials ongoing that are looking at this. Okay, so what about our future combinations? Now, 
I had to summarize as much as I could in a very short amount of time, so I just picked the ones that seem to be the most promising or the most well-populated right now. So obviously MET is a mechanism of resistance that has been well discussed before uh, in patients who've had EGFR TKI and developed resistance. So. There have been a couple of trials that have looked at the combination of combining EGFR-TKI plus MET inhibitors after they've developed resistance on an EGFR-TKI. So this was cabozantinib or XL184 plus or lotinib in patients who had an EGFR mutation but progressed on an EGFR-TKI. And the dosing was 40 milligrams a day of the cabozantinib and then their lotinib was 150. And essentially they had three PRs with a 67% disease control rate. It was a very small phase two trial. Um, and so it was just something, though, that was of some interest. There's another trial, a phase 1b2 study of INC280, which is a CMET inhibitor again, plus gefitinib. Um, and this one, they actually did do molecular prescreening for CMET on this trial. And they basically reported that they had a 17% partial response rate in the patients who had high MET um, by immunohistochemistry or FISH. And so their randomized phase two dosing has been defined, and they're actually already began their phase two um, from March of this last year. So we may get an update at ASCO this year. We'll see. Now, one of the other methods is combining immunotherapy um, with EGFR inhibitors in patients who have, or MET inhibitors in these patients um, who have developed a disease progression. And this is a phase two trial of nivolumab. Um, with EGF-816 in mutated, EGFR mutated lung cancer, um, and also adding in INC-280, which is the MET inhibitor. And so this is a, a little bit of a complicated trial design, but you could see the evolution of now incorporating immunotherapy into our patients who have resistant disease. Now, the third generation EGFR TKIs have also been combined with immunotherapy. This is a phase 1b2 trial, um, and this is basically designed into two parts. Um, you can see that the traditional phase one trials are no longer being utilized. They're now putting tons of patients. You could get like up to 200 in a phase one study now. Um, but in this trial, they have different cohorts and they're combining CO1686 with the uh, Merck agent 3475, so your anti-PD-1 inhibitors. And then, of course, we also have gefitinib with Metamune's agent, the 4736, which is an anti-PDL one. Um, and so, again, very large trials, um, multi-center studies that are looking at uh, the combinations of immunotherapy with this. And then, last but not least, we certainly also have a phase two trial that's looking at small molecule inhibition um, depending on the mechanism of resistance um, using uh, AZD9291 as a third generation EGFR TKI in the patients who have uh, EGFR T790M mutation positivity. And then also, if you have KRAS positivity, they give selumetinib plus docetaxel. And then, of course, you get a randomization later on to the immunotherapy um, of the Medi4736. And then, if you uh, don't have an actionable mutation, you go on to get tremolumumab instead, which is a CTLA4 inhibitor. So, and then afterwards, you can get the uh, Medi-473-6 uh, agent. So very complicated what our future trials are looking at, um, but certainly I think they will hopefully give us some answers as to the relevance of incorporating immunotherapy into um, the first line resistance for these patients or second line. So to summarize, though, for right now in your clinics, if you have an oligo progression, you continue EGFR TKI and do local therapy. If you get global progression of disease, you do chemo, or you could sequence chemo followed by an EGFR TKI. But we highly recommend you re-biopsy the growing um, disease. And the reason is, if they're T790M, you'll be better served trying to get them onto CO1686 or AZD9291, um, and also consider clinical trials for those patients. And so the different mechanisms of resistance are quite diverse, um, but we certainly know that these are, um, we certainly adapt to these with our new clinical trial designs. So this is my current treatment algorithm in the clinic. Um, but I would say that this is more the reality nowadays with adenocarcinoma. Um, Dr. Ramalingan kind of hinted at this earlier, and then um, uh, this was also brought up in some of your other lectures. What? My slide was simple. It was. But, so I just want to break down what you should do for EGFR mutations just uh, to summarize. So if you've got an EGFR mutation patient, you give them in the front line a reversible or irreversible EGFR TKI. Right now it's your choice. When they develop progression, if it's global, rebiopsy. If they are T790M positive, get them onto a third generation EGFR TKI. If there's MET upregulation, then you want to try to get them onto a potential MET inhibitor plus an EGFR TKI trial. If there's small cell, 
I recommend platinum etoposide and then, re, and then sequence an EGFR TKI afterwards if you, if you reestablish control. If there's an alternate upregulated pathway or there's, um, you know, you just don't know why they're developing resistance, but it's not T790M, we highly recommend a clinical trial. Um, there's certainly a ton out there now with combination targeted agents plus EGFR TKI, EGFR TKI plus immunotherapy. Um, so there's a whole host of things. And then certainly after they develop their second progression, you know, we could always go back to chemotherapy, which we're all familiar with. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you.